Hi, my name is Liliana Valenzuela, and this is the panel Women Writers in Translation, Latin American Women Writers in Translation. And so I'm very excited to be here with this fabulous group of women who approach translation and publishing from different perspectives. And we have a, a professional translator, a writer, scholar, writer, publisher, and we all wear different hats. Um, my name is Liliana Valenzuela, and I'm also a poet, a translator, a writer. And so I'm very excited to have everyone here and welcome to everyone to AWP. Thank you to the organizers for um, accepting this panel. And I think it's a very important conversation uh, that is very timely. So thank you everyone. Um, and the way we're going to do this conversation, uh, each person is going to have uh, a, about 10 minutes to speak about their perspective, point of view, their line of work, and then we'll have an open discussion at the end. And because of the nature of this year's uh, festival, when this broadcast will also be uh, at the chat and we'll be able to answer questions from the audience. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you all the panelists for, for being here. Very excited about this. Um, my first guest is uh, Carolina Orloff. She's originally from Buenos Aires and is based in Edinburgh in Scotland. She's an experienced translator and researcher in Latin American literature who has published extensively on Julio Cortázar as well as on literature, cinema, politics, and translation theory. In 2016, after obtaining her PhD from the University of Edinburgh and working in the academic sector, Carolina co-founded Charco Press, where she acts as publishing director. She's also the co-translator of Ariana Harvick's Die, My Love, which was long listed for the Booker International Prize in 2018. In its short life, Charco Press has received several awards and nominations, including Creative Edinburgh Startup of the Year 2018, the British Book Award Scottish Regional Prize 2019, and the shortlisting of Gabriela Cabezón Camaras, The Adventures of China Iron, to the 2020 Booker International Prize. Carolina herself was named Emerging Publisher of the Year 2018 by the South Higher Society. Welcome, Carolina. Very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. And thank you for allowing me to be in this fabulous panel surrounded by such talented women, and thank you to the WDP as well for, for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Yes, and I guess for you it's afternoon, so thank you for joining us at this time. Um, tell us, what was the seed for creating your small independent press, Charco Press, and, and tell us about the name too, what Charco means. Right, well, I, I, I'll try and refrain to to the few minutes I could tell you about that for hours and hours. Uh, but um, Charco basically started as, um, as a humble endeavor to, um, uh, this is gonna sound paradoxical, but it, it was a humble endeavor to shake the canon, um, a bit the, the, the canon we over in the UK and in the English speaking world um, had in regards to Latin American literature. Um, so I, I'm Argentinian, as you said originally, but I have been living in the UK for 20 years, always studying and, and teaching Latin American literature, researching, and, and it was a constant um, frustration, as I'm sure most of the audience here and most of you would, would know, to try and recommend a book or, or try and uh, teach a book uh, in English of a Latin American author and, and always come to the same authors and the same translators as it were, I'm sorry, as, 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 for instance, as well. So um, when um, when Charco started, we, we, we had the ambition to um, um, make this more contemporary, remove the canon as it were and start again and bring to the English speaking world 
contemporary voices that had never been translated into English and uh, provide a, a more diverse um, picture of what Latin American literature is. Um, and the name charco refers to, uh, well, charco is a paddle or, or actually the pond. Uh, in English also you have crossing this idea of crossing the pond and bridging cultures. So we decided to stick to the, to the name in Spanish and, and also play with that, the idea of, you know, um, bridging cultures from all angles, not just the actual books, but also starting from the title itself, if that makes sense. Yes, and you've done very well in this short amount of time. You guys are producing amazing work and being nominated for the Booker Prize. I mean, doesn't get much better than that. And getting all that attention and recognition and hopefully these books finding their place more and more into people's bookshelves and, and uh, university courses and, and where all these voices need to be heard. And from all those authors, you've also published a lot of women writers. I mean, you published both, everybody, but can you mention a few of the, the women authors? Because that's what the, this panel is about. Of course, yes. Um, um, well, I have to start with, uh, with Gabriela Cabezón Camara, who you mentioned in the short introduction, just because um, very recently she was uh, shortlisted for for the Booker International Prize, which is, um, as I understand it, one of the most prestigious and important books for translation into English of, of international literature. And, um, and um, you know, to have made it there to the shortlist, it, the shortlist with her book in particular, The Adventures of Tina Iron, which um, it's, it's um, a challenge in many ways, not just in translation terms, but, um, but, but also um, in, in terms of universities that can be comprised in a single book is it's an absolute um, success for, for everybody. Um, we also publish Margarita Garcia Robacho from Colombia, Brenda Lozano from Mexico, Selva Almada also from Argentina. Um, uh, we've just recently launched uh, Theatre of War by Chilean Andrea Jeftanovich. Uh, we're about to publish the first Cuban author um, next February. Uh, called Carla Suarez. Um, we also also published Ariana Harwick, who you mentioned. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, but uh, yes, we have. Um, if not next year, the following year, we're out of the six or seven books we have. I think you know five by women authors. So um, we're we're not always worried at the fifty fifty, <laughs> uh, you know, level where. We don't, we don't mind if there's more women than, than men being published. Wonderful. And what has been the greatest challenge in uh, creating an indie press, uh, something that you didn't imagine or something that turned worse or better, or what are you most proud of? Um, well, the, the, I think the, um, the, the most difficult challenge still, and I think we, we all have something to say, I'm sure about that, is trying to um, go beyond that block. Um, I think uh, most readers have in the English speaking world, I'm generalizing, of course, that translated fiction, well, first of all, that translated fiction is a genre in itself, uh, and also that translated fiction necessarily has to be difficult literature or niche or um, you know a, a particular kind of literature so going I mean that's the constant everyday um, challenge for us is to try and move away from that and and, and to offer to readers um, exactly this uh, an entry to these universes that provide all sorts of voices and experiences um, and um, what I'm most proud of is um, exactly that. I didn't think we would be where we are now, as it were, in, in the map of, of indie publishers uh, in less than five years. I thought this would take a lot longer. So having had the recognition of the prizes you mentioned and the nominations has been a very pleasant surprise. Um, and, and it fills me with hope because I think readers are ready for um, for what we have to offer for all, for all of us, what, what we're trying to, you know, put across. Uh, so that's, that's, um, that, that fills me with hope for what's to come. <laughs> yes, and, and for the audience listening, we'll have a list of a lot of the authors and books and, 
uh, that we were mentioning here in the uh, event description and the appendix. So, you know, you'll be able to go back over that list. And if you want to order for your courses or for your personal reading, there's a lot of exciting new authors. And with this high quality translations, you know, they're a pleasure to read. And I think some of the old prejudice against translations no longer applies. I completely agree. Yes, ab absolutely. Everything's to be gained in a translation. Right, just entering all these new worlds like the Gabriela Cabezón Camara, which I was uh, fortunate to interview the, the translators for the book, and it's a recreation of uh, the classic work Martín Fierro, which is like a, a foundational text in Argentina, and just giving it a whole different spin and reimagine it from a, a woman's perspective and a queer perspective. And it's just fascinating, and it was so so much fun to to read. Really enjoyed it. Uh, okay, thanks, Carolina. We'll we'll go. I'll, I'll keep moving through our speakers, and then so that we have some time to uh, have a discussion at the end. Uh, now, next is uh, Robin Myers, and um, so, Robin Myers is a Mexico City-based poet and translator. Her recent book-length translations include The Restless Dead by Cristina Rivera Garza, uh, who just won the MacArthur Award, Cars on Fire by Monica Ramon Rios, and Animals at the End of the World by Gloria Susana Esquivel. Other work has appeared in the Kenyon Review, The Common, The Harbor Review, Two Lines, Waxwing, World Literature Today, Asymptote, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, among other publications. She was among the winners of the 2019 Poems in Translation Contest of Words Without Borders and the Academy of American Poets. Her own poetry collections have been published in Mexico, Argentina, and Spain. Welcome, Robin. Very happy to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Yes. Um, you know, when I started listening to the Hablemos Escritoras podcast, your name just kept coming up all the time. I was like, I need to meet, meet her. <laughs> we will meet in person. Someday. In your future, yes. <laughs> and you inhabit a very particular world of being in both publishing worlds in, in Latin America and in the U.S. And you have, I think, really good insight about how the different systems work. Um, and what are the advantages, disadvantages of, it, of each. But first, uh, tell us, how did you get started as a translator? I would say there, there were a few things happening at the same time there. Um, one was that I was obsessed with poetry from a pretty young age, writing it, reading it. And as I learned Spanish, uh, which was a sort of part of the second factor, which is that I was through a family connection to Mexico, fascinated in particular with Mexico and, and really did want to live here. I live in Mexico City now. Um, and when I moved here, I got to know a lot of really exciting young Mexican poets and, and translation for me at, at that point in a way that began to expand very quickly. Um, was a way of sort of situating myself in, in Mexico and, and also in, in the literary world that I was starting to get to know. I think also that in having come from, I was, you know, I studied English literature in college um, and I, I felt a certain amount of pressure, I think, in college to, to become an academic, uh, to sort of devote myself in a more theoretical, research-based way um, to the study of literature. And I really balked at that. And I think what I, what I loved most in studying literature was, was close readings, was really sort of giving myself over to the study of what was happening in language in the texts. And, and what I found by accident in translation was a way to sort of specialize in that, in the exploration of what language does and how it works without having to specialize in a particular subject, in a particular field. It's just the sort of the, the total immersion in language itself. Um, and so I would say that's, that's sort of how I got Hooked. Yes, and, and you're in high demand, I hear. So <laughs> you have like projects lined up probably for the foreseeable future. 
a few it's 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 been a long road and it's been just such an exciting and often sort of dizzying process of of getting to know um publishers like carolina in just the the, the wonderful experience of, of of starting to to have to relationships with such devoted editors um so i feel very lucky and very excited about what's about whatever's coming yeah, so tell us about some of the highlights in your translation career of, of which authors or books have meant the most to you or have been the most challenging or exciting. Well, I guess just given our limited time, I'll, I'll talk about just one example, which is the most recent translation mm -hmm. I've published, which is The Restless Dead by Cristina Rivera Garza, which is very challenging and exciting as a text and that it's both, um, it's a somewhat academic work in, in principle and then becomes many other things and takes on many other registers um, and goes in many other directions. But what it was also really rewarding and remarkable about working with Cristina is that she's a writer who, who incorporates translation into her own writing as a sort of fundamental fact of what she's doing. Um, and she doesn't have this sort of sacred idea of the original text as something that can never be changed, as something that must always remain how it how it how it first was written. And so the the experience of translating her also became an experience of of co-writing. And I mean translation is always co-writing, I think, but Cristina was as we went was rewriting much of the book, was rearranging it. Um, she was writing some new sections in Spanish that I then translated as I was translating the older sections. She also began to write certain passages in English, which then I, I would edit sort of to incorporate stylistically in what was already what was already there but it was a sort of incredibly complex and really exciting process um, in in working so directly with her along mm -hmm. along the way kind of took it to a whole different level a whole other <laughs> level yeah <laughs> yeah the level of complexity you know i think it's hard to fathom uh in just so many different angles you're you're working on the language the culture the different echoes and and when she's herself is introducing english uh mm -hmm. this thing <laughs> but also it was <laughs> it certainly was but it was also so rewarding to work with an author who who sees both writing and translation as such constantly evolving living processes yeah and more uh the translator as a direct collaborator in yeah. real time mm -hmm. absolutely yeah and what would you say you know like some of the differences you see between publishing in mexico and in the us and some of the challenges of uh you know as a translator and as a writer yourself as a poet this is this is a huge question and i, I know. know we can only scratch <laughs> the surface of them but i do think that um for one thing that as I've noticed in that I, I really did get started much more in, in, in Mexico, in the Mexican publishing world. And it's taken me a lot longer to start working on book length projects in, in the US primarily. The US, there are, um, I, I think the role of agents is very different in the US. It's, it's I think, the field of literary agents. There are agents in Mexico and in the Spanish-speaking world for sure. But I think the, the sort of the intensity of that role and the, kind of the omnipresence um, of, of agents in the US is very different, which I think as a translator can be can be very rewarding to work with an author who has an agent because um, if, if you don't, you are the agent as the translator. You are the one, you are scouting, you are sending material out, you're approaching publishers who you maybe have never spoken to before. Um, and so I think in, in an ideal world, um, and of course everything can happen, everything is possible, but in, in having an agent who is also an ally to you and to your author um, is, is, is wonderful. And so that I think is something that can be as a, as a relatively young new translator, um, an obstacle, um, and it can also be an advantage depending on, on and I, so I think the sort of the hierarchy of US publishing um, is, 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 is very daunting. Um, and it remains, I think, very, very daunting. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about in particular, which doesn't actually involve directly publishers necessarily, but 
the but the worlds of literary magazines, literary journals, for instance. I think, and this I think is especially true for poetry in the English banks in the, the English language world, that it's very difficult to get a book published, a first book, especially if you haven't already had publications in journals. And ideally, I mean, you also it's helpful to have a prize, you know, to win a first book prize, which of course is very difficult. And one thing I've noticed in being part of both of having a sort of foot in the door in both English and Spanish language publishing worlds is that there are lots of English language journals that do not allow translations. They don't accept them. And there are even more, I would say, first book competitions that only allow writing in English, um, which is baffling to me. And I think it does continue. And I know that this is, this is something that Cairo mentioned and that we'll continue to talk about, but it continues to create this separation between, you know, the, the translated literary world and the English language literary world. Um, and I think it's something that if more presses in the United States and in, and in your English language presses in Europe um, were more open to accepting translations as just a fact, there, there are translations out there that are being done and that are just as exciting and innovative and, and constantly evolving as, as writing originally in English. And if um, from from the level of poetry, mag of not just poetry, but of literary magazines and publishing houses, just assumed that translations would be just as admitted as any other form of writing. I think that would be an absolutely transformative step. Yeah, so hint, hint for the publishers and, and magazine editors who are looking at this panel. And I totally agree, you know, there, there's a lot that can be done. Thank you so much, Robin, that was Thank fascinating. You. Our next, next guest, this is Abel Zapata. She's a writer, translator, and editor uh, from Mexico. She's the author of Ventanas Adentro, Poetry, Ediciones Urdidumbre, 2002, Las Noches Son Así, Poetry, Broken English, 2018, Alberca Vacía, Empty Pool, a collection of essays published by Argonautica and translated by Robin Myers here and Una Ballena es un País, uh, Poetry, Almadía, uh, publisher from Mexico, 2019. Her critical and creative work has appeared in Periódico de Poesía of the UNAM, Letras Libres, Este País, The Common, Waxwing, and World Literature Today, among others. In 2017, she received a Fonca Young Artist Grant for Poetry. In 2015, she and four friends founded the press Ediciones Antilope, which publishes fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Welcome, Isabel. Very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. And thank uh, all my peers here. I'm very happy to be here. I, have a, I, I seem to have a not so perfect connection. So if something happens, just let me know in the chat, please. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So, what has your experience been in, in, you know, in general as a? How did you get started as a writer? You do many different things. So, kind of, how did everything evolve? And then, how? What has your experience been in being translated by Robin for for this book, Albert Albert Cavacia, Empty Pool, which has again a lot of recognition, I think, in both in Mexico and, and in English. Thank you. So I didn't get the, la the second part of the question. So the experience with the translation, with Robin's translation was a question? The second part? Yes, yeah. So first, you know, how did you get started in the literary world and how, you yeah. know, which paths you took, because you do lots of different things. And then, this particular translation of, of Empty Pool and your experience with that. Yeah. So for me, it was clear. I didn't study anything that has to do with literature. I studied political science as a, as a major. So, but soon it was clear for me that what I wanted to do uh, was more related with books and uh, so I started writing when I was very young, but I also translated as parallel. With, I don't know, like I always, I always associated the writing with the translating. So for me, uh, translation was since the beginning uh, such a creative work 
as much as writing I, I felt. Am I, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, um, then I founded, I co-founded this small press called Ediciones Antilope five years ago. And then editing and publishing also became kind of uh, a creative task too. I don't know how uh, you see it, Carolina, maybe we can discuss uh, after, but for me, it's not so different, uh, writing, translating, uh, editing. It has to do with the same impulse in a way, with the same creative impulse, and also with the same activity, with the same main activity, which is for me reading. I, when I am writing, I read a lot. Uh, while uh, writing, I try to look on books of the subject, not only for research, but also as inspiration. I, I always think that it's like feeling that I am going to be, uh, how to say it, if I'm surrounded by books and reading them and touching them, I feel that I'm going to be like, it's like contagious uh, to, to have books that I love close to me. Uh, and also for, for translating, I always do this and, and for publishing. I recently heard, I think it's Roberto Calasso, it's a, this writer and publisher that said that, uh, that a publisher, uh, an editor's novel is his catalog or her catalog. Uh, so I also think that there's a, in building a catalog in a, in a publishing house, there's a lot of imagination uh, and a lot of thinking about how books relate between them in the same catalog and how collections make sense or maybe not make sense and how to order them. So that's always very, very creative too. And uh, that's how I, how I think about all this world and about the translation of Albert Cavasia, it was, it, all, it also was, I was very lucky to be translated by Robin, not only because she's a very talented and sharp and uh, brilliant translator, but also because I had the chance to be all the time in, in communication with her. So there were many things to, that she had maybe a question or that maybe I had a question because it, it was clear in Spanish and and maybe in English, something doesn't make sense just because the context is so different. So being able to talk to her in the process was very uh, refreshing and very, I feel very lucky for that. Also because she's my friend, but even if she wasn't my friend, I will still think all of this that I'm saying about her. Uh, and yes, that this um, press, Argonautica, uh, is, has a, this collection that is all their books are bilingual. So they have like, um, uh, they are trying to sell them in the United States and here in Mexico. It's very hard because if distribution in one country is hard, then in two countries is even more hard, harder. But I think they are slowly uh, doing it. So I'm happy to, I'm very happy to be in that collection. Yes, thank you. And did you edit your original work after feedback from Robin or, or it, it had already been finished that particular? No, it, it had, I mean, it, it, it was not edit maybe as in completely change the, sorry, there's cars here, uh, the, the essay or whatever, but there, there are things that I, if I were to publish that book again, I think that there's things that I would change. Out of out of that, also with other the other book, the poetry book that I have, uh, Una Mañana es un país, which was Robin is also working on, on that book. There are things that she noticed, uh, mistakes, but not only mistakes, but little details that she noticed that I, that I didn't notice. So, I think the translator job is very, uh, it's a labor of love and it's a labor of attention, of deep attention, and of it's a it's a closest reading that you can have the closest uh, reading that you can do of a text. So in that way is mm. very intimate. I am remembering now just very quick anecdote. Uh, I have a friend who wrote a book in which someone is baking a cake and the translator, uh, I think to Russian, like, or, or I don't know, something like very different from Spanish, uh, noticed that the temperature that he wrote that he was putting on the oven to bake the cake was an impossible, like she, she was a baker herself 
uh, the translator. So she said that with that temperature, that kind of cake wouldn't wouldn't be possible to bake. So that kind of attention was like, that. <laughs> and so he, he he changed, of course, the original text because he, yeah, he made it up, or maybe he he he's not an expert, so he's not a baker. And that's an anecdote I love because that's a that's a very close reading and a very uh, loving, I think, task that the translator is, which I I relate completely with writing. For me, it's not a different. Uh, I mean, it's different, but it's not such a different thing in my head. Yeah, that's a great example, <laughs> you know, the fact <laughs> and attention to detail. <laughs> exactly. Like, is that really uh, what it's like? And so what would you say is your, your primary identity? Uh, a know. reader. A reader. Uh -huh. A reader. Yeah, I would, I would happily give up writing, editing, translating, whatever, if I could keep reading. Uh, yeah, if I had to give up one of it, it of course it would be, uh, I mean, if I had to keep one, it would be a reader. And in second place, I think a writer, because a, a translator is a writer. It's, I, there's, no, there's no doubt for me about that. And uh, I think a publisher also has to be a, a writer of a sort, has to understand writing in a very deep level to be able to be a good editor and publisher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And I know uh, through the podcast that uh, you also recently created this uh, mothering anthology and that you've been giving some workshops about, you know, the creative life, mothering, and making it in a really unique collaborative way with other women and offering it free uh, for anyone on the internet. So could you briefly tell us about uh, that project? Yes, yeah, so this is um, uh, yes, a workshop, as you said, that we organized with a, um, with a bookstore in Morelia, in, in a town in Mexico. And it was, uh, the idea was to read works about mothering uh, novels, essays, poetry about that topic, and also to, it was like a creative writing workshop too, where mothers could uh, think and write about their experiences in a subject that is not, uh, so that is that, that it should be more talked about or more, uh, there should be more books about, about mothering because it's such a, a literary subject. Uh, although it's not, it has not been considered maybe like that by the by the canon, but I think it has everything. No, it has uh, all the uh, elements that are like exciting and and exhilarating and really it makes you really happy. Then it makes you really sad. So it has everything in it to be a literary subject. But mothers usually don't share their experiences because there's a lot of taboos and a lot of social impostures is, I don't know if that's a word, but uh, impositions, I guess, impositions uh, that that make us very, it's something that we live in a lot of solitude and in a lot of uh, shame in a way, in, in some cases. So the idea was to help these women to write their experiences in fictional and non-fictional non forms. And then we made this book to share and we hope that it helps mothers that read it to feel less alone and to it, it's like a, a, a companion uh, in the ways only only books can be that they give you I don't know they are friends too that listen and that uh, give support yeah we'll put the link for for that book too in the appendix and uh our next guest Adriana Pacheco thank you so much Isabel that was very interesting too thank you. Adriana, you you have a, a story there too, or an, a personal essay in that collection, right? Yeah, yeah. I was invited. I, I, actually, um, I invited myself to the to the workshop, which was fantastic. Isabel made a beautiful, beautiful uh, list of readings, and the, the the all the group was really amazing. And the final surprise, the the last surprise, was this book. Uh, yes, I, I share, I fictionalize uh, so, uh, something that I, I lived through when, when I was raising my, my children and the children of other women. Okay. 
Well, and first let me introduce you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Adriano Pacheco was born in Puebla, Mexico, and is a naturalized American citizen. She has a PhD in Iberian and Latin American languages and culture from 2015 from the University of Texas at Austin. And she's uh, the founder and producer of the Hablemos Escritoras podcast and project because it's a whole website and we'll be talking more about that. And she was presented at the Texas Book Festival in 2012 and has publications which include uh, books. One was Romper con la Palabra, Violencia y Género in La Obra de Escritoras Mexicanas Contempor Contemporáneas from 2017 about the lack of representation of, of Mexican women writers and just how little people knew about them. And that was a groundbreaking book that then evolved into this podcast and other projects. And she's been in anthologies. Uh, she has publications in academic magazines and also in literary and cultural magazines like Suburbano Magazine, Vice Versa, uh, Letras Libres, Revista de Arte, and many others. And in her creative work, she has short stories also published in La Muerte es un Sueño, Quince Narradores de Puebla, 2009, A Muchas Voces, Escritora Desde la Maternidad, the, the book we just mentioned by Isabel Zapata, 2020, and Solecitos para Leer Despacito, uh, coordinated by Adriana, 2020, as well as five self-published books for children, which I didn't know. That's <laughs> <laughs> And she's also, uh, among many other things, a uh, social advocate, and she founded in 1988 the largest private orphanage in Mexico called Casa del Sol. And they built a house that has hosted more than a thousand abandoned children. So you know, it's a very uh, wide profile. And wait till you hear about everything that she's doing with this Hablemos Escritoras project. Uh, I don't know if she's one of those women that you know, you don't know how she finds time <laughs> for everything and to do it all so well. Um, and we're going to be focusing in particular, uh, uh, you know, on this podcast and, and, and project of Hablemos Escritoras. First, how would you translate or tell us about how, how this idea came about and how would you translate Hablemos Escritoras? Uh, first of all, let me just thank you, Liliana, that you organized this panel. And I am so proud to be with these young ladies you know, that are really admire and respect. Uh, what I have, I have in Hablemos Escritoras podcast, which is, you can translate it as women writers, let's talk, <laughs> uh, is that the opportunity to, to meet these fantastic writers and readers and publishers and everything began after a, a survey that I made with some of my, my students and I, that was in 2015. And I realized that the Mexican writers at the beginning was just Mexican writers. They were not well known in the country. No, there was, there was a lack, a big lack of, of uh, visibility. So we, we wrote that book and the book uh, took us to many, many ways. And one was like the idea to, to having some kind of more interviews. But in those years, I remember uh, Terry Gross, if you remember NPR and Fresh Air, mm -hmm. she, she was part of my of my day every day, you know? And so I thought like, okay, a podcast is, could be a, a way to talk to them and to surprise readers, you know, with the magic, the magical, the magic in the, the stories of these writers, you know? And uh, at a certain point, so we, we began in 2018 with Mexicans and six months later, I, I, I began getting some um, emails, especially from South America, from writers asking me, could you please include, include some writers from, the, the first country was uh, Argentina. And then was also a big community in the United States, Mexican Americans. Many of them say like, okay, we are not 
very, we are not Mexicans or are we Mexicans? No, we are Mexicans, Americans, so can we be included or not? So we decided to take the challenge and uh, the, the first podcast with Mexican Americans were in, in 2019. And then our first uh, uh, non-Mexican related uh, writer was from Argentina, which was Claudia Massin in 2019 too. And then I discovered the great Robin Myers and I fell in love with all her work because, as you said, it was a name that was crossing all conversations. And so I, I, I just realized, I, I said, nobody, nobody's talking about translators. So I began reviewing some books and checking some books. And I discovered that almost 50% of the books that I checked in that time, they didn't have the name of the translator on the cover. And I was like, uh, is this like a joke or what? No. And so we opened the section for, for translators. And the first one was, uh, actually the first one was in Malvern Books, which is a nice indie bookstore. One day I'm going to also to open a, a, a section for bookstores because indie bookstores are amazing. And we had there a uh, Sean Manning, a man, so the, the first man uh, participating in the program, in the project, and he interviewed uh, Rosalind Harvey. And then after that was Sophie Hughes, amazing. And then I discovered that Isabel Zapata was also a translator. And it was like a um, beautiful adventure, uh, uh, learning and learning. And I am, I am so, so proud and so honored to, to have this opportunity to be a little bit deeper in the in the life of amazing writers yeah and you also have some uh writers from spain too right like yeah. sort of the, the whole spanish-speaking world and the diaspora and all the different places that we find ourselves yeah today. yes now we have more than 160 uh, podcasts and uh, more than a uh, almost 500 uh, writers on our website and we, we have more than 700 uh, uh, books because the, the next discovery was the publishers. For example, Carolina Orlov was uh, one of the, the big, biggest surprises also for us because uh, we understood the challenge that many times and the risks that many times a publisher has to, to, to run, you know, to, to have, to get the, the, the rights for a book and to promote the book and to, to find a, and the, the, the right translator know for that book and now we have an encyclopedia and we have writers from for example last month we had a, the whole month was chile actually this month chile so only the writers from chile we have have a, from from argentina from spain from colombia from mexico from the united states and from norway and uh, yeah and the, the sky is the limit <laughs> Right. Yeah, no, well, I'm very grateful that, that you've allowed this space for uh, translation as part of what you call in one conversation, the, the literary ecosystem <laughs> that, you know, we all need each other for these books to make their ways into new audiences, new readers. And of course, translators are a very important piece of that and which has not often been acknowledged until more recently. So thank you for, for providing that space uh, for us. And uh, you also, I mean, this project continues to evolve, right? Like you now have the website and you have an encyclopedia and now uh, it's also the uh, curator, right? Like, like, like the, you're curating uh, this all these different writers and so people have a, a way to navigate and know how and when to approach and how they're all connected so could, could you talk a little bit more about that yes uh, behind hablemos escritoras and uh, we have an amazing team of uh, collaborators you included and uh, we have one literary curator because in the project we see the books as as pieces of of a, of a museum so we are creating we we want to create and to see uh, everything as a, as you said as an ecosystem that everything is connected so and what what and i want to do something that robin just did uh, i want to encourage some of our listeners and the audience part of the audience to see we are 
we are cultural promoters, we are literary promoters, and we, we need to think out of the box. Yeah, we have been doing the same, the same, promoting books and promoting writers. And the only way we can really go out of this, because to be honest, we are not getting more readers. We hope that we, or maybe we have, we are, but, but not the, the, the amount of readers we want to have. We really want to have all hordes of generations. I want to have thousands of, of, of uh, young people, like Isabel said, I am a reader. No, and we are not actually doing doing that. We really need to, to put more forward the, 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 the material, the books, the names, the, 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 the bios of the writers. But many times that what happened is that people cannot find books, the right book. Because if you go to, an, to, to a website, to a bookstore, to a library, you just see genres, no? you just see an essay, a historical novel, novel, poetry. So what we are doing is that with, with these fantastic te technological tools that we have, uh, we are creating more uh, like um, uh, tax keywords to connect the books, to connect the writers, uh, to break some ideas, some, some labels, for example, generations. You know, we, we need to, to, to break all those statements that we really have so engraved in our minds. And to think about the, the book, to think the book has too many faces and too many layers, and the, the same with writers, no? And, and the, the potential of female writers is amazing, amazing. So the, the, the big transformation in my perspective in the in the literature worldwide is going to come through, through a, a writers, female writers, female publishers, female translators. Uh, and of course, men are included in this conversation, but we are moving forward very, very fast. And that is one of the ideas behind the, the, the Hablemos Escritoras. We have this section with the, the tags and the, the, the keywords, and we have a very specific area for, for publishers uh, to have like a, like a, a list of publishers. I, I don't believe in the, in the idea of canon, but we need to list in, in some ways names. So uh, that is what we, we are doing. And the next step is coming very, very soon. So I really invite you to, to visit this old chat a website that you will see is going to be completely different starting January uh, because what we really want is to to open the conversation to what we are uh, calling a uh, curator so the curating yeah literary curating yes congratulations it's a, an amazing resource for everyone out there whether uh, scholars researching projects, looking for topics for dissertations, books, to the general reading public that wants to find something new and exciting from a particular country or a particular topic, and it just makes it easy to search and find out more about uh, you know the writers, the uh, press, the small presses, and the translators all in one stop shop. <laughs> kind of thing. So thank you so much. This has been incredible. And I think you're also bringing it to the next generation as far as making it accessible to people. So, you know, instead of the book that you originally published, which can reach a certain amount of people, making it into a podcast, it can reach so many more people and we can fit it in into our normal day while you're doing something else. And you also have a very active social media platform. Yeah. And you're constantly, you know, reminding us of all the exciting things that are in the pipeline. So, uh, congratulations on that. Liana, they, they just let me add something. I think that to to really understand a writer, you need to 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 read all her books. Because a writer has also different different uh, faces and, and different ways to approach uh, their own writing, writing, and uh, that is something that we really need to 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 promote. No, you can read one writer, but you cannot know you you cannot know one writer because of one book. So everybody talks about uh, Laura Esquivel, yeah, like Wild for Chocolate. Laura Esquivel has twenty books. No, or 15 books, and all of them very, very different. This is the same, Isabel Zapata is the same, Isabel. No, you have many other books. And when, when, when a writer takes the, when a, a reader takes the time to read the whole production, yes, is when you really go deeper 
And the other thing that is very important is that many readers think about that idea of the feminine writer writing, that all women write about the same thing, the same topics, yes, and that is completely false, completely false. Yes, there are many writers that write about motherhood, of course, violence, of course, a corporality, of course, but also all kind of other, of other topics, no? And another thing is that we we can we have to discover new waves. For example, mat, mat, maternity is a new motherhood. It's a new topic, very very important topic. And also horror novels, vampires, and uh, we have fantastic writers talking about horror. Yeah, gothic literature. Yes, and 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 they are approaching the world in a very powerful powerful voice. Yes, that was my going to be my next question. Like, so what are some of the themes or threads that you have seen from all this uh, hundreds of, of people that you have interviewed now for, for this podcast? What yeah. other topics do you want to add to that? Those are some of the some of, of the, the topics I, I have I have seen, and also. Let me add something. We have in, in, in our website also a section for critics because critics are writers. And there are many writers like Cristina Rivera Garza that are at the same time critics and writers, no fiction writers, I mean, no. But uh, if, you, if you analyze, if you read the work, the production of a critic that is, that is writing fiction, the, he, her topics are completely different. It's very, very, it, it, it's fascinating that you can also like have like a relationship between the topics they are covering, yeah, as the, the ones I, I just mentioned, with the 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 home the, the home uh, their own story, yeah, the, the, their uh, own uh, profile. And just let me uh, add some some more topics that I have here in, in, on, on my notes. And uh, just like um, uh -huh. cultural translation and literal translation, you can you can see that some writers are, are also talking about translation inside of your, their books. The the idea of the author as a, as a show, as a spectacle, yeah, it's just like a spectaculo, yeah. And yeah, and more other other topics topics could be something like a historiography, yeah, roots. Migration, of course, violence is a very, very important topic in different ways, but also uh, some ideas about how how society ha can be involved in utopic uh, worlds, reimagining the world and okay. from a, a, a woman's perspective that is not all even not the same, but it's like new possibilities, which is so important. And with that, we we come to the uh time for open discussion so uh any of you who want to follow up on a previous point or or any other thing that you want to bring up now's the time could i just add some well amazing amazing panel it's just so many things are buzzing in my head but i just wanted to continue on on something uh, very important that Adriana said, well, she said a lot of important things, but this idea of pre preconceptions that that we we all as readers also have to fight against, but um, or, or to try and tumble, but I invite the audience as well to think about how many preconceptions we have when it comes to, to reading um, female authors or women writers, I should say. And on top of that, women, writers from Latin America. I remember there was um, an occasion when we were first introducing Die My Love by Ariana Harwick. Um, we were having an event in London and there was um, uh, a person in the audience who was very almost disappointed that she wasn't um, talking in her book about the dictatorship or politics or or in some, some, some more kind of Latin American violence that, that he could um, put together with this preconcept of what a Latin American novel should be coming back to what we were saying, what I was saying at the beginning, you know, there's all many stereotypes that are that are so ingrained, I think, in the English speaking world when we when we come to approach um, Latin American literature in general, and especially now with the new voices by by women writers, I think it's so important to 
keep on feeding this diversity as much as possible as, as readers and translators and, and lecturers and, and, and cultural um, Yeah, lots promoters, of things have happened since the boom, the Latin American boom. <laughs> We've moved on and there's lots of exciting new voices out there. True. Anybody? A, a, topic, a topic that also comes in. If I could just add something sort of to. Oops, sorry, my internet connection is going crazy. Did I interrupt someone without. <laughs> Go ahead, to? Robin. Oh, I've lost you all. Okay, we'll have to turn my ahead. mic off. Uh, another topic that is coming and coming in the conversation is madness, is madness and childhood. Yeah, and uh, political issues. There are many women that are being very, very brave. And of course, feminism is crossing the, the, the work of many, you know? And, and I think that now Robin has uh, her, her, uh, her microphone working, you know? I do, but please go ahead, Adriana. No, I just wanted to say that that I I am uh, I am thinking a lot when I'm reading the meaning of isolation of, and madness that is happening in 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 the in, in society, and how women are translating also a male a feelings. So women are being translators, yeah. Of, of, of the feelings of, of other people, especially men and especially children. That's what was my comment. Yeah, like some really strong topics, like emotionally, it's just like, you know, they, they go very deep. Robin, go ahead, try now. Thank you, sorry about the blips and, <laughs> but just um, to, I, to comment on something sort of connected to, I think, what, what Caro was saying, too, is that I think fundamentally what is so exhilarating about the both translation as a translator and as a reader um, is that you, you must recognize that you are part of a community. And it is, it is a, a, a way of approaching literature that forces you and invites you more than forcing you to think about the sort of obsessions we have about the figure of the author as this sort of authoritative singular representation um, of everything he or she stands for, when in reality, writers too are, are translating experiences and contexts and traditions. And, and nobody writes alone, and, and just as nobody obviously translates alone. And so I think that part of what is, is, is important about translating and about supporting literature, it automatically opens us up to more communal idea of what literature is for and how it comes about. Um, and ultimately, I think it helps us demystify um, these these sort of canonical figures. And I don't necessarily mean even the canon, you know, from decades ago or centuries ago, but the sort of the obsession with creating a canon now, I think, you know, it, there's a sort of choral effect that, um, that translation invites us to. And um, it's a reminder, I think, that we are always conversing with each other. Um, and that's an abstract idea, but translation and reading translation makes it extremely concrete in what I think is a liberating way. Yeah, new ways of conceptualizing, of understanding it, and, and very radical revolutionary ideas, which I think are very welcome at this point in time, since we're going through a, a world crisis anyway, <laughs> you know, we might as well imagine new ways of relating and of being with each other and creating with each other. Anyone else, one final comment? I think we have a couple, one or two minutes left. Yeah, uh, just one brief thing uh, relate, related to what Robin was saying. It's something that I also commented on before, which is how it impresses me that motherhood, for example, and and I wonder how many female experiences have been have been uh, discredited from from being literary enough. No, so I think what 
also Adriana was listing as new, uh, I don't know, new, no, not only subjects, but approaches to, to, to genre, to terror, to violence, are also women telling their stories and the power of, of that they have politically too. So I, I think it's a very good, I agree with, with what Robin was saying of questioning the figure of, of, of the author, but also of how we don't write in, we don't really write in alone, we write with others. And yeah, I, I am very excited to see uh, this new boom, for example, on, on motherhood. And I think sometimes I have heard comments now, like, oh, it's the moda. Yeah, it's like, cool. uh, how do you say <laughs> the moda? Yeah, so it, it's in style. So we've had enough or whatever. I think that we, we, we haven't had enough. We are just, just beginning to talk. Uh, so I, I expect many, many more books on motherhood and many more books on topics that we are uh, now uh, writing about. And yeah, that's all I want to Thank say. Thank you so much, Isabel. Well, on that note, I think our time is up, but it's been truly wonderful to hear all your voices, experiences, perspectives, points of view. And we'll continue the conversation in the chat and also in the materials that we'll be adding to this presentation. Thank you all for, for being here and thank you AWP for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.